Let us prepare our hearts for worship with the prayer by Alice Trimble. So this is for your mom, Jan. Um, for those of you that don't know, uh, Jan's mom was a, an amazing violinist. She was concert mistress of the Grand Ronde Symphony for many, many years. And um, uh, if I was capable and could do anything close to justice, I would be playing meditation from ice uh, this morning, but uh, that's going to have to be another time. We also look out for those folks that are in my room. Uh, Ashokan, farewell. <laughs> centering words. Out of the depths we cry to God. How do we seek hope in the wake of loss, in the midst of grief? How can our souls wait for the Lord like those who wait for the morning? <laughs> Please join me in the call to worship. We wait for the Lord. Our souls wait for the Lord. And find hope in God's word. Our souls wait for the Lord. More than those who watch for the morning. More than those who watch for the morning. Let us seek hope in our God, whose power is enduring love whose redemption brings healing and grace. We wait for the Lord and find our hope in God's presence. Our opening hymn is from the faith we sing, 2182, when God restored our common life. Again, we are not singing as a congregation, but you are welcome to come.
Please join me in the opening prayer. Holy One, in the peace for our pain, we call to you and to be answered. Hear our voices, O oh God, and the cries of our hearts. Come and bring us your presence. Come and bring us your peace. Amen. A reading from the Psalms today is Psalm 130. A song of the sense. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. O oh, Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption, and he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Our second reading is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5, verses 35 through 43. <clears throat> While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But ignoring what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, he saw a tumult and people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make a tumult and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumai, which means, Little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately, immediately the girl got up and walked. She was 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. This is the word of God for all God's people. Thanks be to God. Let us join now together in prayer and praise. God of sorrows, God of joys, God of hope, God of courage, we offer up to you this day our sadness, our weeping, and ask you to strengthen us in courage and to bring healing to those who are facing surgery or have faced surgery, to bring healing to those who are struggling each and every day to get by. Help us to be people who reach out, people who offer promise, people who offer words of love and compassion, people who are your voice in the spaces that we occupy.
help us to understand thinking around those who are unwilling, unable to be vaccinated, or those who feel are actually even frightened of this prospect. It is difficult to see how we might engage greater in our community when there are so many lives that are still at risk. Help us to find ways of taking risk and being safe as we get your word out to people. Bless us as we go forward to worship in the Haynes Church next Sunday. May we rejoice in being together, me for the first time with this group, and for those who are part of that church who have been separated for over a year. May we rejoice as we continue in worship here in the Baker congregation and lift up those who are unable to be with us. We are grateful for technology, for the way that we can continue to interact. Help us to be as interactive as possible as we come in worship. For those who are truly struggling with the heat, may you offer cool breezes, the breath of your spirit. We know that in heat waves, people will die. And we pray for the lives of all who are suffering. Cool us with your presence. Show us forgiveness for those areas where we have failed or where we have not been your hands and voice and feet. And show us ways where we can do better in days and weeks to come. We pray for those who have passed that their lives will be beacons in our world. We pray for the hearts of those who are broken in the loss of loved ones. Show us your mercy, grant us your patience, and journey with us each day. Be with our country, be with our world, be with those who serve in the military. Be our mighty fortress. Help us to become giants to fight against injustice. We thank you for all the ways that Jesus taught us and we pray that you will hear us now as we pray the prayer Jesus taught saying, Our Father who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. There have been times over my life as a pastor that I have questioned what I'm about to preach. That happened with this particular message. Did I really want to preach on lamenting? Was it the right time? Was it the right place? Do people even understand what it means to lament? Then I attended opening worship for annual conference last Sunday. The first speaker and her message spoke of lament. Then the bishop in her sermon spoke of lament. 
And then there was that terrible destruction in Florida. And I thought, yes, this is the time to speak on lament. My thought was, okay, God, <laughs> I get it. What does it mean to lament something? The dictionary defines lament, lamenting or lamentation as expressing deep sorrow or grief over loss, any kind of loss. The first chapter of lamentation, the Lamentations of Jeremiah begins this way. How lonely sits the city that once was full of people. How like a widow she has become, she that was great among the nations. She that was a princess among the provinces has become a vassal. She weeps bitterly in the night with tears on her cheeks. Among all her lovers, she has no one to comfort her. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They have become her enemy. Judah has gone into exile with suffering and hard servitude. She lives now among the nations and finds no resting place. Her pursuers have all overtaken her in the midst of her distress. The roads to Zion mourn, for no one comes to the festival. All her gates are desolate, her priests groan, her young girls grieve, and her lot is bitter. Does any of that speak to our hearts? about what has happened perhaps over the past 15 months or even the last couple of days? Have we mourned and wept over the condition of our global communities? Have we grieved the loss of housing from the wildfires last year? Have we wept over the loss of life, not only from the pandemic, but from shootings, riots, protests, buildings collapsing? Are we all at all despairing of the deaths of people of color? Will we grieve our churches, perhaps, if people choose not to come back when we're open? We don't know what's going on. But will we grieve, we people of God, for what has been lost? From 2 Samuel 1, David intoned this lamentation over Saul and his son, Jonathan. He said, your glory, O Israel, lies slain upon your high places. How the mighty have fallen. O daughters of Israel, weep over Saul, who clothed you with crimson in luxury, who put ornaments of gold on your apparel. How the mighty have fallen in the midst of the battle. Next Sunday is Independence Day. While we're still dealing with the effects of a pandemic, I'm certain there are people who are planning for a day of parties, parades, and picnics, families, and fireworks. I read recently that my hometown is planning a full-blown July 4th celebration. And let me tell you, it was always one of the best places to be on Independence Day. If you could deal with the crowds and all of the out-of-towners who never seem to know how to drive. <laughs> Whatever you are doing next Sunday, I invite you, please, first, be in worship. Either here or in pain. And then do whatever you had planned. But I would ask that this year, consider what it is we are truly celebrating. The Revolutionary War brought the death of over 30,000 people. Do we ever consider at any point during our barbecues the cost in human lives? Do we lament the fact that people went to war over this idea of freedom? 
looking at what Independence Day, July 4th, has become, we forget that we're celebrating the bravery of men and women who risked everything to sail from England to the New World 400 some years ago. We forget that people were willing to die so that they would be free to believe the way they wanted. The king had made it impossible for anyone with differing beliefs to feel at home in England anymore. And so a group of people set sail to another land where they could decide on their own way of worship. We tend to set all of that aside when we pull out the grill and the illegal fireworks. You don't have any, do you? I, I'm not thinking this crowd would, but you never know. We've forgotten that England wasn't happy about these people leaving and demanded that they remain loyal to the king. The king expected this new country to be his, another conquest for the British Empire. But the people said, no. The people revolted and demanded their rights as free men and women to live and worship as they chose, and they died fighting for those rights. Before, perhaps before that first sparkler is lit, we could spend a few moments lamenting the loss of life then and now, for people are still fighting for their freedom. Moving ahead almost another hundred years and another war. Imagine what it must have been like following the Civil War and the Emancipation Proclamation to discover that not all the slaves were informed of their freedom. Just this month, June 19th, was made a national holiday to help us remember that not everyone received equal independence in 1776, nor in 1863. There were people of color, slaves in Texas, who were not told for almost two more years that they were free, that they no longer had to live and work as slaves. When we're surrounded by red, white, and blue patriotic songs, fireworks, and all that we expect the day to be, we forget that people die. Instead, families and friends gather and eat and argue. Some of them drink too much, get obnoxious, and go home swearing they'll never get, to get uh, together again with those people. Weep, O oh, daughters of America, for those who would forget the price that was paid. David lamented the loss of Saul and Jonathan. We don't practice lamenting much here in the United States. A public display of grief is more than we want to deal with. We let people be alone express their sorrow and sadness. It's rare that we would find a community coming together in grief, let alone a state or an entire nation. We don't want to experience the pain. And seriously, we don't know how to lament. Think about what has happened this past year. The lives that have been lost to a virus, the protest over the whose lives matter. Shootings and death every single day. Would we ever consider having a day of public lament over what and who have been lost? I don't know. Public lament makes us uncomfortable. We see it in other countries, but how does it make us feel? When we watch the newscasts from Japan or Mexico or China, Jerusalem has a wailing wall where men go to cry out to God. This is corporate lament. We've seen the clips of women and men crying out in grief over the loss of family and property after the tsunami or earthquake or war. The community expresses its grief together. Might that be healing for our souls? 
Would we come together and cry out our sorrows to God? Could we lift our loud ululations and break down some of the walls that separate us? We're so adamant about maintaining our individual space and decorum that we don't want to be caught weeping and wailing anywhere. Maybe not even in the safety of our own homes where no one would see or hear us. Are we missing out on something? Have we become so civilized and sophisticated that even shedding a tear in public is cause for alarm? Three of the four scriptures for today are about lamenting. And it always amazes me the timing of these scriptures. This has happened to me before where I set up a service and I'm thinking, I don't know what this relates to. And then something happens in the world. And the words that have been presented to us are perfect and fitting. We consider Miami and the weeping and wailing there. Psalm 130, which we heard earlier, is often used during funerals as a message of hope. But it starts out in a cry to God. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. The passage of Mark, which we also heard, is the story of Jairus coming to Jesus because his daughter is ill. Before Jesus can get to the girl, people come to Jairus and tell him that his daughter has died and need Jesus alone. <laughs> and Jesus responds, do not fear, only believe. When they arrive at the house, there are all kinds of people there weeping and wailing over the loss of this child. The reality here is that there were people who were paid to mourn, to wail loudly at a death. That's how it was done. And you know, Jesus threw those people out. And he took the family. But even at that, it's a public act of grief. They lamented over losses. Sometimes we forget to let it out. We don't want to bother people or God with our sorrows, and so we simply tuck it out alone. Yes, we will celebrate our Independence Day, enjoying our freedoms and families and friends, but somewhere along the way, lament the losses as well. Not only the lives lost two or three hundred years ago, but the lives that are continuing to be lost because of war, injustice, disease, lack of good health care, lack of clean water, lack of freedom or peace here and around the world. We should be lamenting that not all countries have the freedoms that we have. Even when we're masked, we still have more freedoms. Cry out, O oh people of God, for the losses God's children continue to sustain, even as we claim and celebrate our freedoms. We're going to spend a few moments considering all of these things. If you feel prompted to speak out into this space, words of lament, please do so. And I know that'll make you all very uncomfortable. Don't worry about speaking over other voices because we're creating a sense of lamenting and a sense of community. Those of you on Zoom, feel free to unmute yourselves so you may participate in many voices lifted up to God. Find those places of woundedness within yourselves and offer them up. Let us spend a few moments in lament. For the deaths and losses in Miami. The hundreds of thousands of people who died from the pandemic. 
for systemic racism. For systemic racism. For the violence on our streets. Violence in our streets. For a lack of empathy. Lack of empathy. For the creation of a culture of misinformation that has people frightened of the other, frightened of the truth. For our built-in willingness to hate. Our built-in willingness to hate. an environment that is facing so much uncertainty and death. For unloved children, for voices that are suppressed, Holy God, we lift these up to you and pray that you will be with us as we find other times to lament the losses in our world. Amen. When Bishop Elaine gave her message last Sunday, she had three negative points to make. And then she said, and now here's the good news. She said, you can't ever leave anybody in that space of the negative. So I offer to you the good news. We are still here. We have returned to in-person worship. It won't be too much longer before we can be mask free. We will survive. We will, by the grace of God, continue to be a voice of inclusion, forgiveness, and healing in these communities. Amen. As we consider our offerings that we wish to give to God, consider how lamenting can also be an offering to God in the field pastor. I do want you to see this picture for those of you who have the bulletin. It's on the cover of it. This is a painting by Salvador Dali. It is the way on the wall. We have so many gifts that we can give. So many gifts that we can offer to God, not only monetary, but in our actions and our words. So consider this, offering our gifts to God is a holy act. In this sacred moment, let us offer our gifts and our lives to the holy work of God. And I will remind you that the offering plates are in the back on the outsides of the pews. There are separate ones for Baker and Cain. Please join with me now in our offering this
a love that stretches farther than we can see or even believe. You have given us a grace and a forgiveness that is deeper than our vulnerabilities. You have given us a healing and a hope that makes us whole. Take now the offerings of our hearts and our lives, even as we give away all you have given us. Amen. Our closing hymn is Be Still My Soul.